nation How green is the lead How long will men learn To be free Very good. Good morning, Ajahn. Ciao, Ajahn. Ciao, Ajahn. Let us pay respects to Ajahn. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. I'll just wait another minute, so I'm just a little bit early. Is there any announcements or any advice you want to give before I start? Um, I think uh, tonight there will be only half an hour for Q&A. Okay. And then uh, Metta meditation, half an hour. Okay. Uh, and, then... <laughs> <laughs> and then what? <laughs> so sing... Uh, uh, closing, whatever, yes. Yeah. With, blessed, with blessings from Ajahn Ram and then uh, the closing speeches from the three organizations. I think. Excellent. Very good. So, uh, might as well. I've got nine o'clock on my computer, so we can now maybe start. Okay? Yes. So the, the usual schedule, try and finish about five to ten. Uh, for a 55 minute talk, a toilet break, and then a guided meditation afterwards. And uh, one of the things I would like to focus on on this morning's talk, because it's you know, the last talk of this very brief retreat, is many people are concerned how do we um, use these great teachings or practices like meditation or loving kindness later on, or all the wonderful wisdom Ajahn Brahmali has shared with us. How do we use this in our daily life? And it is like, you know, the meditation is almost laboratory, a laboratory where we can really understand the nature of our mind, the nature of our reactions, or what I was saying yesterday, that life is very much a relationship issue and that we learn how to deal with the relationships we have with uh, uh, the things which happen to us and how to turn those things which happen to us into always something very, very positive. And already, you know, we've had COVID this year, and COVID means we have to learn more, uh, more useful uh, skills in our life. Sometimes the skills we put together with other people, especially the people we thought we knew and loved, our family, for a much longer time. You have to learn how to, to live with one another in closer quarters. And it's something which has always amazed me. I always thought I was a little bit deprived uh, having a poor family, but seeing later on the great benefits of you know, that having a poor family, uh, just staying in a very small uh, council flat, which was incredibly small. Now I look back upon it, but because it was small, I couldn't escape from my brother, from my mother, from my father. I didn't have my own space in the house. It wasn't the house, it was just a small flat. And so what happened was, you know, you learned how to get on together. And I learned so much from, please excuse me, seeing my mother and father argue. Because <laughs> like many people, oh, they sometimes had different ways of looking at things. And they would argue. And they couldn't argue in private at all because, you know, my brother and I were just in the same small apartment, very small apartment, and so that we'd see everything. But then, you know, they, because mother and father couldn't escape from us, they just couldn't escape from each other either. So in the end, it always came down to the reconciliation, to the two of them just coming together, hugging and kissing and saying sort of sorry to each other. 
And for a, a young boy just growing up, maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I don't know what the age was, just seeing that happen, I realized that arguments are natural in life. You know, we won't see things exactly the same. No one ever does, <laughs> even in this monastery. <laughs> We're supposed to be nice monks, and sometimes you may think that Ajahn Brahmani is a clone of Ajahn Brahm. Of course, we have differences every now and again, and I, I tell Ajahn Brahmani, I encourage that. So the last thing I want would be to see him just doing exactly what I do, say exactly what I say, just out of fear, or just out of uh, over-respect. It's not very reasonable or logical. So anyway, so when we do have this sort of opinion, oh, it's over here, you know, we don't take it seriously. And we then even if we need to forgive because there's no animosity at all, we realize that's part of life when you're living together. And the way to overcome that is this beautiful forgiveness, which I, again, saw with my own eyes, see my mum and dad saying sorry to each other. So they were allowed to argue. They were permitted to have differences and sometimes be upset at one another as we are upset at life sometimes. But to see that in the end there was something more important to them than just being the one who was right. And the most important to them was actually just uh, being in love and living together. They had to learn how to live together because it was a small apartment. <laughs> and I had to learn how to live together with my brother as well. So those little lessons in life, you know, in small apartments or when you're in meditation in your small apartment of your mind, this is actually where we learn so many skills, which are amazing for life. And knowing that, you know, that life, you, you cannot escape from things. You, know, you, you can sort of let go of things, but then you always have to come back after the meditation to go to work, to be with your family, to be with your kids, your parents. You know, sometimes the parents can cause you all sorts of problems. Your wife, husband, kids. A lot of times that we learn through meditation to have this beautiful sense of respect to our mind. Even yesterday is one of the really nice questions, which sometimes you get really good questions, you wish you could have a whole hour to answer them because they're very powerful questions and the answers really help in life. And it was just why when I'm meditating, and I can get very peaceful, equanimous and empty, but I don't see any happiness there. And the, to me, that was a crucial question for development of meditation and also the development of life, to see the joy and the happiness. And sometimes that joy and happiness on the silliness of life. You know, when people say stupid things, I do stupid things. But then they can just stand back and laugh at themselves about, you know, just the silly things which we do in life to people we love. And I must admit, it's all the those silly things which we do, or which I do, the big mistakes which I make, they're the ones which I love telling other people. It makes them laugh, it brings them joy, they don't feel they're so hopeless in life. And then people ask me, why do I do such silly mistakes? And I say to them, because I do silly mistakes sometimes, because they're almost like on purpose, because I don't want to have other people, especially those monks who live with me, to feel so inferior in my exalted presence. <laughs> so I make mistakes. This is say that, okay, you're okay, you know, not being who you are. That's only a joke, by the way. Don't sort of say that Ajahn Brahm is an arrogant you know, person. No, it's just in order to just be human. And you know, the, the peace enlightenment part of it is actually the relationship you have with mistakes be able to learn how to make peace with them, be kind and be gentle. And you find that that's what works with meditation. Whatever you're experiencing, when you sit down, cross your legs or sit on a chair, close your eyes, what are you experiencing? And uh, you've heard me say this so many times, and the monks here know this, this is, they say this is Ajahn Brahm's meditation method, whatever that means, but they say what it is is you make peace, you be kind and be gentle. And that's what you do with life. Not just your meditation, but you know, going to work. You learn how to make peace, you know, with your computer when it crashes. And have you ever seen that? I've seen that with some people. They just 
banging their computer against the wall. This stupid computer, just why did you break down now? It's not the computer's fault. And sometimes you see people do that with their wife, shouting, why do you do this? Why do you spend so much? Blah, 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 blah. That's not her fault. That's just her conditioning. <laughs> so in other words, we learn how just to make peace with life. And be kind. And be kind to your computer. Their computer. I don't know if you can see it. There. I'm stroking my computer to make sure it's fine. You see, it got very bright for a few minutes. That must have been its smile. But when you're kind to things, oh, I've got lots of stories about kindness. And there's a kindness to machines. So when you learn lots of kindness in your meditation, you can do that in all sorts of places. I was, I just went to Norway to give some talks a few years ago. And you know, the really nice people picked me up from the airport outside of Oslo, and got in their car, and there's this big queue because no one can get outside the airport. There was, there was uh, the, the boom gates going up and down. They got stuck. And no one could actually do anything to get out. So I came out to have a look. What did Ajahn Brahm do to stop boom gates, which is going to make, you know, make us lose lots of time you know, to go to a talk, which I was going to give soon. So I just went out there, put my hands up, and gave the boom gates some loving kindness. And as soon as I gave the boom gates some loving kindness, <laughs> it was really weird. The boom gates went up. And everyone was very happy at me. I may have made a few converts in Norway to Buddhist meditation. I don't know how that works. But, you know, the mind does interfere, you know, with uh, machines even. Even when I had my old uh, cement mixer so many years ago, because, you know, I was making brick walls. Sometimes the brick walls weren't all level, the two bad bricks. But my cement mixer was... Yeah, I say my cement mixer because I did most of the work. And so often it's happened. I asked somebody else, you know, to make some cement for me. And they couldn't get it to start. And then so often I just went over to that cement mixer and I did stroke it. I spoke nicely to it. And people may have thought I was crazy, but then when I pulled the little handle to get the motor started, it would work every time. I knew that cement mixer, it sort of knew me. We had a good relationship towards one another, and it would work. And even to motor cars. <laughs> that was a weird experience. I'm sure I told you this story because it was a, a great story. So we have a youth group uh, in Perth, like many people have their youth groups. And after teaching their youth group, they just uh, hang around a bit longer. I had to go and speak to another lady somewhere, just outside of the monastery. Outside, outside of the city centre, sorry, in Perth. And when I was walking back, they were still there. I thought they were going to the, you know, the beach to you know, have some fun together, just to do some meditation on the beach or whatever. But anyway, they were still there because they, they couldn't open their car, especially the boot of the car was jammed. And so they, were, they had the key, they were trying, trying, they'd been trying there for about half an hour. And before, because they couldn't open the boot, they couldn't go anywhere. So they're getting more and more frustrated. And then Ajahn Brahm comes down the road. And one of them says, oh, hey, it's Ajahn Brahm. You know, Ajahn Brahm, can you please use your psychic powers to open the boot? We've been trying for the last half an hour and you can't do it. And I said, well, I can do that. But what's in it for me? I was you know, joking around. I never accept any money or anything. But I said, the person whose car it was, now, this a young Indonesian girl. I said, Ronnie, if I open the boot of your car, will you become a bhikkhuni? <laughs> and that was my deal. <laughs> I'll open the boot of the car, she becomes bhikkhuni. And she laughed, and she never thought it was possible. I've been trying for half an hour. So she said, OK, if you can open this car, I'll become a bhikkhuni. So I put the key in, turned it, and opened it first time. <laughs> And she'd, oh, no, 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 I've got to become a bikini now. What have I said? But I just did that with kindness. But fortunately, she was safe. And the reason why she was safe was because 
another member of that youth group was a lawyer. And the youth, the person who was a lawyer, uh, told her that, yes, it's true, you said you're going to become a bhikkhuni, but you never said when. So as long as you become a bhikkhuni in one of your future lives, that's keeping your promise. I said, oh, that's unfair. But anyway, it was just a good bit of humor. But how could you open the boot of the car like that when no one else could? It's not psychic powers. It's loving kindness power. And loving kindness, which you learn in meditation, can help you know, in all parts of your life to open boom gates, to open car doors. You try it. And sometimes if you have really good meditation, you know, these things happen. And of course, the best story, which I can't resist, was of the ex Anagarika, he was here for about a year in Bodhinana. And then he went over to uh, complete his studies in Germany, I think in Frankfurt University, I believe it was. And anyway, you know, he was just straight off the plane back to university. So you know, about a few days before was in Bodhinyana Monastery. And so when he first went onto campus, he went past the ATM machine. <laughs> and I love telling this story, it's absolutely true, believe it or not, it was true. He went past the ATM machine and the ATM machine, he said, made a sound at him. He never heard this sound before from any other ATM. It was a gurgling sound, a very pleasant gurgling sound. And he interpreted that as the ATM was welcoming him onto campus. So from that time on, he'd always give love and kindness, you know, not just to all sentient beings, but to that particular ATM machine. May you be happy and well, ATM. May you never run out of money. May never anybody try and steal anything from you. And they never shout at you or get angry when they find they've got no credit in their account and so they can't get any money out. May you always be happy and well. Uh, whatever he did to give love and kindness to a machine. And he, and he said, one afternoon, or just, you know, yeah, probably afternoon, he was sitting in the sunshine, just to maybe just a few meters from the ATM and just uh, having his lunch, a few sandwiches. There's no one else around. And then he heard the gurgling sound for the second time in his life in the ATM. And he turned around and he saw this 20 euro banknote come out of the machine. And no one had been close to it for about half an hour. No one had punched in any numbers or put any credit card in. <laughs> and a 20 euro note came out all by itself. And he was dumbfounded that you know, this could actually happen. And so he went over to the ATM machine. He took the 20 euro note out of the machine, waved it in the air and said, does this belong to anyone? Does this belong to anybody? And there's no one around to claim it. So he put it in his pocket and thanked the ATM machine for being kind to a poor student. And I love that story because that's, you know, life, like money and ATM machines. And it actually works when you have a positive mind. You know, that machines are even kind to you. Do you believe that? Or like, I'm not sure if I told you Ajahn Chah's story that, you know, when he first went to UK, went to England, he was on a Thai Airways flight. This is so many years ago. The first time overseas. And the, the landing gear didn't operate properly. As we were coming into Heathrow Airport, the landing gear didn't go down. And so it was an emergency. And apparently that the authorities, emergency authorities in Heathrow, even they sprayed the foam on the runway this Thai Airways jet was going to come in on. You know, just to, for safety. So people saw that and I think they were announced that, you know, there was a bit of a, a problem. And then all these people, and mostly Thai people on the Thai Airways plane, and of course the flight staff, they all came up to Ajahn Chah and just please help us, please, 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 it's a dangerous situation. Please, you know, can you do something, Ajahn Chah, to get the, the landing gear down? And they were all really asking for everything. 
and his no sooner afterwards the landing gear descended and they could land safely and after <laughs> after they landed Ajahn Chah he just really he's a really funny man sometimes wise man but very amusing sometimes and then as they landed Ajahn Chah said to the monks sitting next to him look at them all they're all getting their stuff to get off the plane they're not even coming to thank me they're not even looking at me now it's so they're all looking at the pretty Thai air uh, flight attendants, <laughs> not at me anymore. <laughs> and sometimes that's what happens in life. You go and help people, but once you help people, then they, people go and get busy with other parts of their life. But anyway, it's wonderful just how the sorts of things which you can, you can learn as well in your meditation, in your, in your goodness, can help you in your life in a beautiful way. And so what you're learning here is not just to become enlightened, not to press out in meditation. It helps you in all aspects of your life. In fact, I remember the beginning of this talk, I told how meditation affects your health in a really, really, really positive way. And even well, when I first came to Perth, you know, I'd always go, I think every six months, I think it was, to give blood at the Red Cross we went there to give blood because you know, I sometimes regard this as not my blood. All the health and vitamins and, and whatever else, you know, make up my blood. It all comes from the, the generosity of the donors. So, you know, my blood comes from you. you, know, you give me food, you know, you give me cups of tea and water and that's, you know, creates my blood. So I think it's only right to share it with others. So I used to go and give blood every six months. And once I went with a new monk to give blood. And this monk, he had a high profile job, I think in the electricity utility in Perth. He was also a regular donor, a nice kind man. So we both went to give blood together. And you have to take the blood, uh, the blood pressure before you give blood. And so they took the blood pressure of this monk and the nurse who was doing that said, hey, there's something wrong here because she had a, all his old records. And so what's wrong? He said, well, your blood pressure used to be you know, a bit on the high side. Now it's really gone down. What have you been doing? And before he could even answer, she looked at him and saw he had a bald head and brown robes. He was a monk. He said, ah, you've been meditating, haven't you? <laughs> he said, yes. He said, oh, that explains it. So even the nurse, and this was a long time ago, maybe 35 years ago, even then, the nurses knew this how wonderful meditation is. Of doing simple things like knowing your blood pressure, you know, keeping everything peaceful and happy and healthy. That's why, you know, that people like the BGF and the uh, Brahm Center and Bodhinaya Singapore and Buddhist Fellowship, how we all spend a lot of time teaching meditation in order to have people more healthy in life. And I'd also mentioned the benefits of you know, this terrible disease right now called depression. I don't know why, but there's so, 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 so more people come up and say they are depressed. And maybe it's more recognized these days. It was always there, but maybe not as intense. And uh, now people are recognizing the problem and just how it's overcome. And one of the beautiful ways of overcoming depression which you learn from meditation is perceiving the happiness in life. It's always been there, the joys, but one becomes just so absorbed in the negative part of life, one can't even see the sunset. It's right in front of you. Be watching some sort of movie on the TV instead of going outside and seeing the beautiful uh, streaks of light across the sky. And so much more happiness in the people you live with you know, sometimes you look at those people, oh, you know, I'm a friend to the husband and to the wife. And I've known them for a long time. They're really good people, but they can't get on together. It took me a long time to understand how, how come you two don't love each other? You're really lovely people. I love both of you. You know, as a monk to a disciple. And it's because they keep looking at the wrong things. They keep looking at the two bad bricks in your husband's wall, the two bad bricks in your wife's wall. Maybe there's more bad bricks than that. But then, if you want to live happily and harmoniously together, if you want to be a wise, compassionate, 
couple. You look for the 998 Goodbricks there. When Mao says 998 Goodbricks, you find some two perfect bricks. It's perfect bricks which you look at and really admire. Say, wow, that's amazing. You're really a kind, good person. You look for the goodness. And of course, that's what one learns in meditation. That's why I always tend to teach, look for the happiness. It's there. But sometimes we just don't notice it. We're not looking at it. We sometimes take it for granted or we, we're not used to it. And maybe it's because our culture, especially in the workforce, you know, if you're managers, the job of a manager is you know, seeing what's wrong in a company and improving it, correcting it. We want, maybe not, shouldn't call them managers, but corrections officers. <laughs> There's a difficulty, a problem, or just like today. At Bodhinyana Monastery, we just the work meeting where we do all the uh, stuff, you know, to make sure this monastery is well looked after. That they're saying all about the things which are wrong in the monastery this morning. It's a tap leaking by the women's quarters. The biomax is a bit stuffed up. That's a wastewater system. Not working properly. We're running out of brooms or the fronds for the brooms. So can we please uh, do a little less sweeping or more sweeping? Management it seems to be always about seeing problems and fixing up the problems. Maybe that's why people get depressed focus too much on what's wrong and fixing that up instead of focusing what's right. Beautiful monastery, all the leaves which are on the ground this morning are beautiful leaves, all yellows and browns, they live their life on the leaf and the very strong winds in the summertime and they get blown off on the ground, it looks beautiful. And the water is dripping, beautiful sound of dripping of water, especially in the dry weather like, like uh, Australia at this time of the year. So one starts to learn how to see things, perceive things in a different way. The work is happiness. It's not just solving the problems and cleaning things up. So, you know, when you have done the washing up after lunch, don't just say, oh, it's all done now and just go out and do something else you're fixing things up. You just take a look at the, the clean dishes, admire them. Just spend a few minutes reflecting not on cleaning things up, but enjoying the beauty of you know, these wonderful clean dishes, which are there for people to use, and monks to use in a few hours time. And that makes you just enjoy what you're doing. And instead of always just being people who fix things up, focusing on thoughts and fixing that up. And even just all, all of you do counselling. Actually, that's everybody does counselling sooner or later in their life. You know, because we have friends, just you know we have family members. Even <laughs> I was loving all these stories I have. You know, I was just going to Singapore a few years ago on Singapore Airlines. Because I'm a frequent traveller, I get access to the lounge in Perth Airport. And they really like me in that lounge. And I'll tell you why they like me. Because you know, this is your one of the honored customers. Okay, when you go into the, the lounge in an airport, and you know, it's a private lounge for frequent flyers. When I went into that lounge, the the lady who was on duty there, just looking after it, said, Oh, hi Jan Brown, thank you for coming. He said, Okay, if I have a few questions with you afterwards. I said, Yeah, as soon as I sort of put my things down, I said, How can I be of service? And she was going through a, a, a divorce in a marriage. So at my lounge, instead of having cups of tea and just sitting relaxing, reading the newspaper or something, I spent the hour in the lounge before the flight left, <laughs> having a, a personal free counseling session for the, the poor lady in charge of the, the lounge. <laughs> I don't know if that was you know, expected when you were uh, an important customer and you go into a lounge, you just give free counseling to the people in charge of the lounge, but that's what I did. And I enjoyed that a lot. It really meant a lot to the person in charge of the lounge and that's why they let me in there. And that's not why they let me in there, but why they give me special attention. Because I was kind to everybody in the lounge with things like that. You know that, I think you all know my food preferences and because I usually left in the early morning, not the early morning, but just after dawn, 
that they usually make sure I had a good breakfast. And <laughs> in the Singapore airport lounge, in Perth airport, in the kitchen there, they had a few cans of baked beans, especially for me. <laughs> I remember when I was checking in one day, checking in at the counter, and then they said, they rang up and said, he's here, Ajahn Brahm's here, please <laughs> start warming up the baked beans. <laughs> I felt embarrassed when I also thought it was so much fun. You serve others and they serve you. You give others special attention, they give you special attention. And so my life as a traveller, as a counsellor, you know, you get your benefits from it. You don't get any money, but you just get some pretty good baked beans out of it if they know what you like. So, <laughs> so all these wonderful things. But when you do do counselling, giving, remember what you're doing and you get so much happiness out of it when you, know, you help people. You look for that happiness, the happiness of goodness. And I should have mentioned at, the, at that question about, you know, how do you see that happiness? Is that you can actually start even your meditation with things you know, like, as the Buddha said, like Buddha Nasati, reflecting on the Buddha, what it means to you. What is a Buddha? The amazing things which that one being did. And so you get inspired. And inspiration is a beautiful type of joy. And that inspiration, it just oh, gives you so much boost of happiness. And then you start meditating on you know, letting go or on the body or on the breath or whatever. Or you do what they call like seal anusati, on your, your precepts, your goodness. All the amazing things you said you, would, you didn't do for the, for the happiness of other beings. Like that question last night, you know what happens if you've got a girlfriend but you're attracted to somebody else's wife? You have to say no. And it's hard to say no. But then you get so much joy and happiness that what a wonderful person he was. You was restrained, you know, these biological urges, an urge to be good and to be kind and not cause problems to others. You did it, you know, you restrained. And you imagine your, your precepts and how you said no. And maybe other people have said yes and caused more problems in life. You said no. Well done. So you learn how to praise yourself and to find that joy from all that goodness which you've achieved. And the other thing, your generosity. And I, I know personal experience just how kind and generous uh, all these people listening in Singapore and KL and uh, Indonesia and other places, well, some of your generosity just really moves me very deeply, honestly. And sometimes I think of that, I feel that. It brings me so much happiness and joy. My own and other people's generosity, goodness, they're giving. So many of you are organizing this event. And you, know, you don't have to organize it. You could be a little participant so you didn't have to worry about making sure the sound is okay or that people are keeping social distancing or that you know, the connection is working. You don't have to do that, but you volunteer to that. That's your, your generosity. And please contemplate that. Let your mind settle on that and feel how good you are. Some people say, don't feel how good you are. If you feel how good you are, you get big headed. You don't get big headed. You get big tummy like me, <laughs> but not big headed. <laughs> no, you get happy. And that's the whole purpose of these reflections at the very beginning. To bring a sense of joy, inspiration, happiness. And you start your meditation with that. Or you're at work. And things are going difficult. You know, the bosses are like you, or you know, you got stuck in the traffic and you're late, or your sales are down, or whatever it is. Just how about contemplating the times when your sales were really great? Or the kindness you've given to others, the goodness in your life. You can inspire yourself when you train yourself to inspire yourself. So training yourself to inspire yourself is you just look at all your good qualities. That is, ah, no, nah, that's normal. 
don't do that. These are beautiful qualities. You've done excellent good karma. So why not just focus on that? Stay on that for a little while longer and allow that good karma to be accessed. People are often so worried about their bad karma that they take their good karma for granted and don't make use of it. So what a terrible thing that is. It's like having all this gold in your house and you just forgot where you put it. You just don't have any access to it. It's a huge amount. Just always remember just how the Buddha taught about the law of karma. You know, one bad act of karma you have to pay back many, many times. Same as one good act of karma, you get that back many, many, many times over. It's not 5% or 10% interest. It's like 10 million percent interest. In other words, all the good acts of karma, which everyone who's listening to this talk, all the good karma you've done is huge. So great. It's almost inexhaustible, your store of good karma. So why can't you access it? It's because you know, we, you've got this terrible sense of being taught that if you think about the good you have done, it's going to cause you uh, negative consequences. It doesn't. Just contemplating, remembering the good you have done creates happiness. I just want you to do more good karma. You, know, you get encouraged, inspired by your own goodness to keep on going on and give more goodness to others. That's my story anyway. It took me a while to actually to accept the fact that I was actually helping somebody. Although this is what a monk does. And maybe they were just exaggerating to make me feel good. But then when I started accepting the praise of others, the acknowledging, actually these it's a very smart, wise people in Singapore. Maybe, maybe they were right. Maybe I'm a good monk. Maybe. And that was quite a revelation for me. Unless I can start receiving their praise and their kindness and their goodness and feel good about any service which I've given. And that created this incredible happiness inside. Sometimes that happens. Some of the comments which I've got, oh, it just blow me away. Where just even recently, there was a, a person who went in lockdown over in, I think, the Northern Territory of, well, um, of Australia. They couldn't actually come and visit me or see me, but they got very depressed. And eventually the, they listened to some of my talks. And the depression just went, disappeared. They overcame it just through the talks. And they said that they had... I got so much out of that, that recently they just came to Perth just to see me. Just to see me to say thank you. Coming all that way, a difficult flight, and you know, having to get these little passes to make sure you can get into Western Australia and go back again without sort of uh, any of the COVID restrictions. And they, they came because they had to do that. So it emphasised the point that was really important for them. Remember the time when this lady, <laughs> similar thing, came all the way from, from Switzerland. This was before COVID. But she came, and it makes me joyful even now, that's relating the story. She came to Bodhinyana Monastery and she said, look, I've just come into Australia from Switzerland to see you. And after I leave the the monastery. I had just arrived, I think, the morning or the night before. And now after I leave the monastery, I go straight back to the airport to catch a flight back to Switzerland. This is not just maybe one day that she was in Australia. I said, well, did anyone want to say no? She was just lots of stuff to do back home in Switzerland. Why do you come then? And she took out of her little bag, like a big handbag, one of these really beaten up old copies of Opening the Door of Your Heart. And it was just so well used. It had corners which were just scuffed and, and all the pages were a little bit dirty. <laughs> and she said, this was my, my Bible. And she had all these diseases and stuff and depression as well. And she said, this is what got me through everything. And she said to me, said, I just have to come and see you, even though it's this financially ridiculous cost. 
And it's such a tiring, because it's just such a long way, all the way from Switzerland to Western Australia. I had to do this, she said, to ask you to sign my book. <laughs> I said, will you do it for me? <laughs> she didn't realize I've signed many, many books. But of course, you know, signing her book was special. So I did this lovely signature for her in her book and she was wet eyed and gave it back to her, thank you. Then she left and back to the airport, got her plane back to Switzerland with a signed copy of her book from the author. And of course that made her happy, but well, I got such a big share of that happiness. So the meditation afterwards was just really beautiful for me because I allow that happiness to come in. And I celebrate that happiness and I make use of it. One of the wisest disciples of the Buddha was the lady Wisaka. And there Wisaka, she, she went to see, oh, that's right. This is another one of those stupid stories, but wonderful stories. I tell this usually every year at the entry to the rains day, because this is when it really happened. A couple of days before the rains was about to start the rains retreat, Wisaka invited the Buddha and the monks to actually to come to her house for some food. And so she was making the food and just before it was time to, to go to her house to receive the morning lunch, there was a big heavy rainstorm. It was the start of the rains retreat. And because of the simplicity of the monastic lifestyle, the monks would usually just bathe in the rivers or lakes if there were um, any close by. They could not, they didn't have any plumbing or showers like we have these days. So they would know, bathe in nature. But during the range retreat, when there was really heavy uh, falls of water, most of those rivers were dangerous to bathe in because the currents were so, so fast. If you got stuck in the current, you'd be dead. So anyway, they couldn't bathe in the rivers. So whenever there was a big rainstorm, they would actually bathe outside in the rain. I, I remember doing that in Thailand a few times in the range retreat, such a heavy storm. You went under one of the, the spouts from the gutter and oh, it was a really a strong fall of rain. You soon got yourself cleaned up. It was actually quite invigorating as well. So anyway, so all the monks, there's a big heavy rainstorm, including the Buddha apparently, they actually, they bathed outside in the rainstorm. And that was exactly the time that one of the assistants of Wisaka was sent to the monastery to invite the monks to come to the house. And <laughs> this young girl who was the assistant, she went to the monastery and all she saw was a bunch of naked men, nothing on them at all. And so she turned around, went back and said, I don't know where the monks have gone, but they're not there. So we didn't see anybody, all I saw was a bunch of naked men. <laughs> and of course, Wisaka was really smart. And she said, go back again. I think they'll probably return by now. <laughs> And of course, in that time, they dried themselves off and put their robes back on. And so the, the maid invited the Buddha and all the monks to the house. And then after the food was given, they were just having the chit chat. And Wisaka said to the Buddha, what happened? He said, look, maybe it's okay for you guys. There's some very refined women. And even my maid didn't know who was there, seeing people with no clothes on at all. So she said, can I ask for a favor? What is it? Can I ask that I, because you know, she was a wealth, from a wealthy family, can I offer rainy season bathing cloths to all the monks in uh, Sawati? So that if you do want to bathe in, <coughs> I'm sorry, if you do want to bathe outside in the rain, at least you can put a, a cloth around your lower part so you don't look naked when people come and visit. He said, can I do that? Just me, no one else. And while I'm at it, said Wisaka, can I also offer the similar cloth to the nuns as well, the bhikkhunis in this area? And can I also, that when monks or nuns come for the first time here, they don't know where to get food. So can I give them an invitation? They can always come to my house the very first day they arrive so they can get something to eat. And also the last day before they leave, because when they leave, they may need some extra supplies on their journey. And I'd love to be able to give it to them. 
And when they're sick, can they come to my house so I can get special medicines for them? And they know that when a monk or a nun is sick, other monks and nuns look after them. So can I also give food and stuff to the monks and nuns who look after the sick? And something else she asked for. But anyway, she said, can I be the only one who does this for the whole of Sawati? And then the Buddha said, what? Can't you let other people do that dana as well? Why should I let you do the dana? Just you, no one else. And then Sawati, this brilliant wise woman, this is one of the reasons I like telling the story, because it just shows her great understanding and also shares that understanding out with others. And she said, well, if I am the only one who gives these cloths and food to people arriving or leaving or those who are sick, then I know that any monk or nun you know, during this range retreat who gets a very, very deep meditation or gets great insights, maybe becomes a stream winner or becomes fully enlightened, I know that because I've given it to every monk and nun, but I would have given them this wonderful assistance, a robe or some food. And when I know that I helped directly this monk or nun becoming enlightened or having a good meditation, that would give me so much joy and happiness. And I said, I mean this, and I can focus on it, I can remember it, I can contemplate this and develop it. I get so much joy and happiness that will make my meditation deeper. Maybe I may be able to attain those things too. Uh, when I heard that, I got, you know, I was just so impressed with that woman's understanding. And so was the Buddha. He said, okay, yes, I give you that sole privilege, no one else in Sawati, to offer these robes for rain season and also all these other little things like food and for traveling monks, sick monks, just to you, because you know what dana is all about, what giving is all about, and how you make use of it to create this happiness and joy, and how this happiness and joy will give you so much power in your meditation, that you will just use that happiness and joy to get the deepest of meditations. And that is such a wonderful truth there's happiness and joy out there. Take it from outside, first of all, and bring it inside. And then, so your meditation takes off. Piti Sukha is at the, the very beginning, and it gets bigger by the end. And I think you all remember one of my favorite stories about Ajahn Chow and myself. He used to come to this monastery in Thailand where I was staying every week. And he would give Dhamma talks, and then go for a sauna. And this particular occasion, he gave just a beautiful Dhamma talk. Not all Dhamma talks just really hit the spot. I think you've listened to so many of mine, but some of them, they hit the spot. Some of them are okay, some of them just really missed the spot. This was one which just went right to the bullseye. And I was so inspired. I can understand Thai perfectly. As actually speaking the Northeastern dialect, I understood that very well too. Been a monk for quite a few years by this time. And it inspired me so much. You, know, you get so uplifted, so energized, so mindful and happy. And there's lots of other monks wanted to go with Ajahn Chah to the sauna to help him. I would usually go there to give services. But this time I was just so happy. Oh, other people look after Ajahn Chah. I'm now going to just find a nice quiet place and meditate. I just went onto the concrete outside the, the dining hall, just in a quiet place. And then just crossed my legs on the concrete and just sat for two hours. It was really blissing out. So happy. But I knew how, to, how valuable that happiness was, which I got from a very nice teaching of Ajahn Chah. And then afterwards, I just got up, just really just happy walking on air, as they say. No, I mean, I don't mean sort of walking in the air like a supernormal power. I mean, just felt so light and happy and not a care in the world and so blissful. And the thought came up, well, let's go and see if I can do a service to Ajahn Chah. And of course, I never did a service to him, but he did a service to me. 
because I met him on the path. We just were going to cross. And so I stopped to let him pass, but he didn't pass. He stopped and stared at me. And that was one of those moments I will never forget in my life. I've told you many times what that moment was. I stood there, just still sort of blissing out. Hindrances disappeared from the deep meditation. And then he just, he went inside my mind. That was one of the few times that you could you know, feel that Chancha reading your mind, but this one, you could feel him inside it. Really experience. I don't know how I can explain it, but it was like, you know, he was inside just having a look around. And of course, as I often say, and this time I was quite happy. My revered teacher was having a look inside because I just come out of a nice meditation. My mind was really clear and sort of bright and pure for a change. <laughs> and then when he went out again, that you know he he looked at me really seriously and said that wonderful insight question. Brahma Wangsa, he said, why? Tamai in Thai. This is a powerful moment. Just there was Ajahn Chah, myself, and there was, I think, one, could have been two, a, a Thai men, Thai laymen, who were going to take him to the car and drive him back to Wat Bapong. His son was over. Why? He just had a look inside my mind and I thought maybe I could answer that question. But of course, I was still stupid, arrogant young man. And I said, I don't know. And then he, he laughed. That's the other thing I learned from this. When people make mistakes, you don't shout at them or put them down or criticize them. They know they made a mistake. They know they're being stupid. He just laughed. And I often say that we Western monks cause Ajahn, Sa, Ajahn Chah so much happiness so many laughters he got from us stupid guys. <laughs> you know, been in great universities, but you know, in life, just you know, we were just you know, maybe grade one. And but anyway, after finishing laughing, he became kind again, peaceful. And he said to me, I'll tell you the answer. A wonderful moment. He said, I'll tell you the answer to the question why. And he said, there's nothing, there's nothing, Brahma Wang said, there's nothing. I mean, that's you know, said from someone who, who knew it totally, deeply. And then he asked me, again with immense kindness, do you understand? And I said, yes. And then he said, no, you don't. <laughs> oh, that was the most, one of the most miserable moments. <laughs> and then he walked off. But, you know, it wasn't that miserable because he'd given me this special teaching. And I saw so he focused on that for a long time. There's nothing. That's the answer to the question, why? The answer to all questions. Maybe this evening when I answer the questions and you say, this is a question, I say, there's nothing. What should I do when my, my kids fail their exams? There's nothing. What should I do when I get sacked from work? There's nothing. What should I do when I'm dying of cancer? There's nothing. What should I do? You're always given the same answer. Then I'll ask another question of you. Do you understand? <laughs> you say, no. <laughs> and then eventually one does. So little by little, that, and that gives me so much joy and happiness. And so I, I use all the wonderful experiences which you've had in your life. You don't forget them. I don't know why people always remember the bad experiences of their life. And when they go to see a counselor, a psychologist or psychiatrist, they always repeat all the terrible things which happened. Why don't we have a psychologist or psychiatrist? And when you go to see them, they only talk about the wonderful things that happened in your life. And you let go, you, you go a big sign, you can't talk about the unhappy moments of your life. We're only going to talk about the happy ones the positive ones, the joyful ones. When you do things like that, you get a big boost of happiness and joy. And you allow yourself to cultivate that happiness and joy. And that leads to really great meditations, absence of things like depression, energy when you go to work, 
a positive attitude to all the people you, you live with and work with. And great innovation, even in our workforce, by creating sometimes the ability to cooperate with people. Again, in a workforce, you know, in your life, you have to work with other people. <laughs> and if you're just an island unto yourself in your workplace, if you're just uh, worried about your own progress, that's not good for the company. And again, I was telling some of my monks recently that that was one of the reasons I didn't like being a school teacher, because you had to give exams. And even when I was a young boy, I couldn't work out why I was not allowed to help the friend sitting next to me in an exam. I knew the answer. He or she didn't know the answer. What do you mean I can't help her? The teacher said, that's cheating. It's cheating. You mustn't do that. It's not cheating. It's compassion, kindness, cooperation, helping others. You know, she would help me some in some other thing, which I didn't know. Can't we help one another? No, it's called cheating. I didn't get that. But even today, I don't really understand that. Why we can't support one another and help one another. It's not cheating. It's caring. So anyway, little by little, you learn how to create this happiness in your life. And you do that in meditation, strengthening it there. You take it into your workplace, you take it into your family. You can be wonderful human beings. And of course, that's how we make use of this practice. So later on, when this retreat finishes, there's always another retreat coming up soon. <laughs> that's why I think retreat's ending. And there's another one coming up, I don't know, a week or two weeks or something time. That's our life. So we can make use as much as possible of these occasions to relax, heal our body, give it some health. There's some beautiful uh, pieces of advice which help us become smarter, more compassionate, more cooperative human beings. And just realize that the most important thing which you will ever develop there is that peace, that wisdom and compassion. And that's more, honestly, it doesn't pay the bills. You've got to go to work to pay the bills. But it's more important than the bills. It means you can live in a small place. It doesn't have to be expensive in the top suburb. You can go to work in the, the, the train, not in a car. That you can live a very peaceful life with little money and lots of happiness, and lots of time. So may there be little teachings which mean you do connect the world of meditation with your family, with your work, with your studies, and with having a wonderful life in this human realm. And when you die, you realize you've made use of this time. You've grown and learned so much about yourself, about relationships, about peace, happiness, freedom, and how little things are when things go wrong in life, which they often do. That's just more sh shit for the mango tree. So everything is positive. You smile no matter what happens. Okay. Now, oh, just one more little, very quick anecdote, because I think you all know uh, Dr. K. Sri Dhammananda, the late chief of, uh, in Malaysia. And uh, he's well loved by most of you and especially by me and many others. And I always remember when he was about to die. And I remember his doctor, he told me this person, I checked it out, is this true? That when you told him his, his disease was terminal, there's no cure for his cancer? Did he burst out laughing? The <laughs> doctor said, yeah, that happened. That really just blew my mind. It just was the first I've ever seen anybody when they're told they're going to die of cancer, just burst out laughing. It really impressed him. So even what you learn here in meditation means that at the end of your life, just before you die, you can burst out laughing on your hospital bed. Possible. Okay. 
So anyway, now we can have a toilet break, otherwise you might die now. <laughs> so off you go to have a toilet break, and then afterwards we'll do a meditation for 20 minutes or so, whatever happens. Very good. Hello, John Brown. Hi. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, how can I be of service? <laughs> Okay, should I ask you when you like to work again? <laughs> oh yeah, sure. I'm working all the time. If it's not here, it's somewhere else. If it's not somewhere else, it's... Ah, sometimes I work in my cave, work on myself. I'll work on my no self and just make peace. But yeah, I'm, I'm giving a talk already somewhere. I think Eileen has got me down to give a talk somewhere soon. Would you like <laughs> to expose some of your younger monks? Oh, yeah. We've or like uh, once a week, uh, half an hour with Dhamma. Well, I've done about half an hour, once a week. Because they already do. Hey, maybe what... I'm just thinking that once a week on a Tuesday evening, 7 to 8.30, they do a, a talk for our little Armadale group. And they should be going to this place in Armadale Hospital, the local area and just to give uh, meditation and little talk and but because of covid and hospitals they say that they're the most dangerous place in the sense of people get diseases that's where they go to get checked and you might get um, contract the disease there we decided to stop going there for a while and just do that talk on zoom on a tuesday night and of course what happens angie is that as soon as somebody p finds out there's a talk from one of the monks from Bodhi Nyana Monastery or one of the nuns, then everybody gets involved. And so I just sometimes see all the people who are on this retreat <laughs> and they're not in Singapore or Malaysia. <laughs> they're sometimes in, you know, the, I'd say the usual suspects who come on almost every retreat <laughs> which they can find and join in. Why not? They're most welcome. So I just yeah, wonder. So if you could send us the Zoom link, then we can share it. And since it's on Zoom or, you know, it's on Zoom, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then benefit as many people as possible yeah. without yeah. having to do anything extra. Yes, it's a freebie for you. I mean, for the young bugs, it's, I, I was just really touched by this because you know, during the COVID the lockdown, and there's no, very few talks around, we couldn't go anywhere. So, you know, we asked the young monks to go and teach a little bit about meditation for half an hour or something. And so the young monks were really good. They gave it a try, most of them. And then they got all this wonderful feedback. Wow, what a great talk that was. Wow, you're really good. Wow. And most of these monks, they didn't realize just how good they were. And when they actually got their feedback, wow, they thought, this is marvelous. This is wonderful. It made them happy, really inspired them. Got more of them into doing some more teaching in the world. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. I'll make that. Actually, there's, there's one obviously tonight. And one doing it tonight is, oh, then Mudito is giving a talk this evening for the Armadale group. I don't know how you can get the link, but I might. Actually, you can't listen to this evening because you're supposed to be listening to me. Well, they can start next week next week yeah <laughs> I, I, was, I was giving away my customers my clients <laughs> Hello, anyway. Dan. hi so yes yeah, good idea okay. great resource sir. and it's also as you know it trains the monks here they learn how to give talks and... Hello, Dan. hi anna yeah. hey. um, this is just to greet you from medan achan from Medan. Oh, excellent. Medan. Yeah. 
Thank Hi, you, Ajan, for coming to our little Sunday school, the Ehipasi Komedan, on yeah, your yeah. last uh, visit. Ah, yes, I remember Medan. that, yeah. Yeah, that was, Indonesia was the last place I went to before the lockdown happened. So that's great, great to go there. And how's Venerable uh, Sri Panyawaro? Venerable Sri Panyawaro. He's uh, good. Excellent, yeah. I saw him when I was there. Uh... Your visit? Yeah, the last time I visited oh, last yes, February. at Wihara Mahasampati. Yes, right, yes. So I saw him there. He's senior, oh. but I'm more senior to him. <laughs> so I could poke him in the chest and say he's not eating enough or eating too much, I forget which. So have a good bit of fun together. That was very marvellous. I enjoyed that. And Medan is one of my favorite places. I just had so much joy there. I remember going there one of the first times. I went to visit one of the Buddhist schools there. And then I had my bowl there because I was traveling with it at the time. And, and then all these kids came up and they wanted to put them with their lunch in my bowl. You know, and it was just beautiful. They almost doing this spontaneously. They weren't told by their teachers to do this. So I opened my bowl and got all these like sweets and chocolates and stuff. <laughs> Very bad for me. <laughs> but what was really nice, it was given with you know, the, the children of the school, they wanted to do this. They wasn't told to, that they should do this by somebody else. And that to me just was just so beautiful. So wonderful kids of Madame. You are very inspired, Ajahn. I, I was inspired, not inspiring, I was inspired. <laughs> so well done. So I'll come back there again as soon as possible. Oh, yeah. It's good. Good news for, for Medan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just a matter of just getting... We will organize have, about uh, 3,000 more. 3,000 more visits? Uh, 3,000 more. <laughs> okay, 3,000 <laughs> visits. <laughs> 3,000 more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ajahn. No, Bakus. Okay, I suppose we'll do the meditation now. Good idea, Angie? Yeah, ready to go. Ready to go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So here we go. We're sitting down. Hey, Angie's left. Okay, <laughs> still there. <laughs> so, sitting down, and close your eyes. And with the eyes closed, even before you start watching your body. To see if you can bring up all the goodness you have done, at least some of the goodness, even today. What really kind, good act have you done today? Well, I've been usually saying some of the good things I've been doing. Can you get like what we call mudita? You get joy in what other people do as well. Realizing there's a lot of beauty and lots of giving and lots of wisdom and compassion in this world. This is a beautiful part of life. And you have been involved in much of that beauty, that goodness and that kindness and that service. Can you feel the effects on your mind when you bring up those memories of goodness and kindness? It brings up joy very easily. This world is a beautiful place sometimes. Often it's actually always there, but sometimes we just focus on the mistakes in life. On the news, that's all they have on the news, the mistakes and problems and difficulties. But in life, in many places, there's lots of peace and joy and kindness and laughter. You've known that, you know it today. And it brings this beautiful perception of beauty and happiness. It 
there's so many good people in this world. You don't have to be afraid. And once you start arousing those feelings of joy and happiness, now turn your attention to your body. The joy and happiness tend to evaporate much of the problems of the past and the future. It certainly gives you hope. It certainly allows forgiveness. Perception of beauty does those things. So you can start looking at your body, how are your legs right now? How are they positioned? How are your feet? Sometimes people put their feet in these shoes, which are so tight or high heels. The feet have no freedom. So I love having barefoot. Just feeling the toes in the air or against the, the carpet on the floor. My feet become really sensitive. Almost like my hands, I can feel the carpet. I get those feet almost like to massage the carpet till those carpet starts to massage the feet. The feet feel really nice. They're enjoying themselves down there. Weird thing to say, my feet are enjoying themselves. It means I've let them go, they're independent. They're also having some happiness and rest and relaxation. And I move my attention past my ankles, pausing to make sure the ankles are at peace and at ease, they feel good. No, no joking, no exaggeration, my ankles are tingling now. You feel them. Again, because of practice again and again and again, I can be sensitive just to the ankles and nothing else in my body. It feels totally at ease. So I move the attention up, I've got my calves back and front. Feel those big muscles on my calves. Moving up, making sure everything's okay. I don't want to miss any aches or pains or injuries or something. Until I get to my knees. My knees don't give me problems. Thank you, Nice. 69 year old monk, and you're still looking after me. Thank you. Again, I get this feeling of the knees are just resting at peace. You can feel the sensation there, but it's a very peaceful, calm sensation. I know they can stay like that for a long time with no problem at all. It's joyful to relax. I go from my knees up my thighs. These big muscles, they do so much work. The main reason why I can walk. When I go past my thighs to my butt. Because I do lots of sitting, sitting meditation and sitting down to talk to people, sitting down on the office chair to teach a retreat over Zoom. My butt does, takes a lot of pressure. I care for you, but I just, my attention just stays in that one place, just on bottom feeling. When you get to know it, once I know things, can feel them, get to understand how they work, then I can relax everything. Got to understand first. Got to have experience. So your mindfulness can realize if your butt is in a bad position or in a good position. I care enough not to move on until my butt is really comfortable. 
that's comfortable, I can move on. Move on up my neck. Sorry, that's a bit too far. Up my spine. Nice stretch. Oh. I don't know why I don't stretch more often, but certainly I got into the habit of doing it at this stage of meditation. Feels great. And then I let go. And then the back relaxes, finds its optimum position. So check it all out. Left side, right side, right, bottom, top. Everything is just so at ease. And then the front of my body, check all the digestive tracts. Can't feel anything there. Stomach it feels okay. Then over to the lungs and heart and liver and springs and stuff around the back. I don't know exactly where they are, but everything feels okay down there. And again, especially for female, check your breasts, making sure that there's everything is at peace there, at the ease. And if you do find there's something which is uh, unbalanced, don't be afraid. That feeling is a body trying to get your attention to say there's something which needs to receive some really lot of kindness. So give you that part of your body kindness. Let's open the door of your heart to that part of your body. Giving you lots and lots of love. You're part of me which is not quite in balance. I care for you too. I care a lot. May you be happy, may you be well. May you be at peace. And sometimes you can take a exp- uh, feeling, a sensation. When you learn how to give kindness, kindness relaxes and eases things. It's like the air is opened up to the rest of your body, so healing can come. Kind healing. And then eventually go to your shoulders and just let them all go. My shoulders become nice and loose. If I kind of see myself holding something tightly, Let go. I know it's letting go when that tight feeling eases off. I also know, as I said yesterday, when that tightness is eased off, when things are loose, you have a natural resilience. When something hits you, no tightness or tension there to make things break. Everything is so loose and soft. You have a natural resilience. You go down my arms, my upper arms, which are always not a problem at all. If your arms have a problem, just focus on them. Slap those arms with kindness. There's much better as you can generate. See what happens. If Meta can get a 20 euro note, out of an ATM machine. Imagine what it can get out of your body. Body responds with relaxation and ease and happiness. You go past your elbows. Now I can feel the elbow feeling. It's at ease, it's nice. There are my forearms past my wrists to my hands. And there, my hands, all these nerve endings in your hands. It's so easy to be aware of your hands. I'm not just aware of them, I'm kind to them. And they're in a position which they're comfortable, but I haven't been in this position on this retreat. It's a unique position for me with my hands, but they're okay there. So I'm going to leave them. It's like I ask them. Do you want to be moved? You get a very clear answer. No, we're happy here. 
Now we go back up to my shoulders and neck. Got a bit of hay fever this morning, that's why I can feel some blockage up in my in my sinuses. But it's also the sometimes I can travel down to my throat, but my throat right now is fine. So I go up to my face. And again, my sinus is a bit blocked. And I'll care for them. Wow, I feel peaceful so quickly. Where are my eyes and my mouth? Relaxing everything. And the delight of my body is very strong now. As I am aware of my body as a unit, Sitting here at peace. With lots of delight. Feels at ease. I develop that perception of joy. I don't just experience it and then let it go. It stays with me. It gets stronger. I let it be, rather than let it go. And I know its importance and value, which is why it stayed with me. I never take the delight of relaxation or any of these other delights in meditation for granted. They're important. I value them. They're golden. My body is so nice. And I go to my peaceometer. How peaceful are you right now? Pretty peaceful. Where did that peace come from? Present moment awareness and silence, yes but also from the perception of joy. When the present moment is perceived as joyful, who wants to go anywhere? The mind stops wandering. It doesn't have any sloth and torpor. Because this, this moment is just so magical. So brilliant and appealing. And it's happiness. Once I see the joy in this moment, the mind stays. In this moment, silent. I can write my essay about it afterwards if you need to. Dig it all out and think what it means afterwards. Now just enjoy. Like listening to a great piece of music. I'll make my comments later. Now I'm just enjoying the silence in this moment. And I'm going to be quiet for three or four minutes.
How much joy do you feel now? Why don't you perceive it? It grows. How much peace have you got with that joy? If you need to come out, which unfortunately I do, and I'll just allow my attention to expand until I can experience in my body again. With inside, you couldn't feel the body, but now you can feel it. It's my body's warm, it's very comfortable, it's very relaxed as well. Thank you, body, for allowing me to meditate. I open my eyes and smile. to end the meditation. So thank you everyone for giving the opportunity to give. And I'll see you again this evening for the final Q&A. Ooh, that was nice. Bye.